Hey guys, welcome back. My name's Reese, and for those of you that don't know, um, I make most of my money through real estate investing. And so that's why I wanted to make this video today to talk about how to buy your first rental property. Multifamily rental property investing, when done correctly, uh, can be very lucrative. Now, multifamily residential investment property is by far my favorite investment class. And throughout just the past year and a half through investing in a few multifamily properties, I've been able to increase my net worth uh, by over six figures. And I must admit, I was moving very slow. Um, I was very nervous for my first rental property. But once you buy that first one and get over that fear of investing in real estate, the potential is limitless. Um, I was very nervous for that first rental property. This was until I met uh, now my mentor, but my, my real estate agent at the time, who really held my hand and walked me through the investment buying process. And so that's kind of what I want to do today is through video, um, walk you guys through the home buying process uh, through the eyes of investment. And I have outlined today just 10 simple steps that when really broken down, there's nothing to be afraid of. And you can use these 10 steps to get started and buy that first rental property and over the next year or two, increase your net worth by at least $100,000. And in addition to your net worth, the residual rental income that you'll receive monthly from these properties, although not passive, um, is money that can help you retire and become financially free. And now there are many ways to buy rental property with no money out of your own pocket. Um, however, today we're going to keep it simple and kind of highlight the process of buying your first investment property uh, with just you coming up with the money on your own through your savings, through a co-signer, through a family member. Um, but we're going to assume you have the down payment. And so from looking at uh, real estate investment through the path of you're using your own money, obviously step number one will be to come up with that down payment. And now there are many different loan programs that are available to you to buy investment property. There are options if you're going to live in the property. So if you get a, a duplex and live in one unit, and there are also options if you plan on not occupying the property, but keeping it as a full investment property. And so if this is your first investment property and you're going to have trouble raising the money for the down payment, I would highly recommend considering living in a unit. I would highly recommend buying a multifamily property and then living in one of the units as that will allow you to put low money down. And so there are a few low down payment options um, as a primary residence for one to four units. You can go the traditional FHA route, which is a three and a half percent down payment. I tend to try and avoid this at all costs as there's a lot of fees associated with FHA and then there's a lot of issues that come up. So the property needs to be in very good condition to qualify in the first place. And if you buy three to four units with FHA, um, the property needs to set up, satisfy a self-sufficiency test, which just means the rental income of three of the four units, for example, on a four unit, needs to cover your PITI, which is very, very difficult in most cities and most real estate markets. However, in most areas, banks will have available a conventional low down payment option. And these are usually 5% down, uh, they're much more lenient than FHA, and for the most cases, they qualify for one to four units. But be sure to talk to your lender on that, as some of these programs are only for uh, one to two units. The nice thing about these low down payment conventional options is, as I said, they are conventional. And so when you have your real estate agent put in an offer on a property, um, the loan type is shown as conventional and not FHA, which helps make a stronger offer. Please be aware, however, that most of these low down payment options will have PMI. So when you run your analysis on um, these properties, make sure you consider that extra cost. And now if you don't plan on living in this investment property, uh, depending on how many units you buy will uh, determine your percent down that you have to put on the property. So you'll be able to buy some investment property, some single family investment property for 15% down. However, usually, two to four units will be around 20 to 25% depending on who you call. And now if, if raising the money for a down payment is going to be a very big barrier to entry to you, which it is for most people, please consider uh, clicking the link, I think it's up in this corner, to my previous video on how, uh, on some of the tips I use to save money fast and to complete this first step of buying real estate much quicker and getting you in the game. 
And now step one, raising the down payment might take a while, obviously. So if you're if you're saving a thousand dollars a month and you need to raise twenty four thousand dollars, that's you know that's obviously going to take you two years uh, to do. And so while you're doing this, while you're raising the money, we're going to work on step two, which is to improve your credit score if it isn't good already and to build your job history. And so in order to qualify for a mortgage, you're going to need two years of work experience. Or the nice thing is if you're a recent college graduate, the banks will consider your college degree as work experience. So if you um, are a computer engineer and you've got a four year degree, and then you get a computer engineering job, even if you have one day of work experience at that job, they'll count the last four years as work experience. And so as a newly uh, graduated college student, you actually can qualify for a mortgage based on the job experience portion. However, another consideration is going to be your credit score. And this not only uh, determines whether you qualify, but it also determines the interest rate you're going to get on the loan. And now there are loan programs that accept applicants with uh, credit scores, I think as low as 550. Um, however, you really want to wait and get your credit score up into the 700s before you apply for a mortgage. Unfortunately, anything lower than a 740 and you won't be getting the best rates you can on your mortgage. However, once you get above 740, anything beyond 740 doesn't really matter anymore. It's just kind of, uh, kind of bragging rights at that point in time. So the goal here, before we move on to step three, will be to get your credit score between 720 and 740, and that way you can get the best rate possible um, on your mortgage. And so if you're starting with either no credit or bad credit, um, I'd recommend searching on YouTube um, for videos on, on how to build your credit fast. Now I'll be having a video on this exact topic coming out here within the next couple days. So if you want to wait on that, um, I'll have all that information you need in that video in order to keep this one short. However, there are a lot of little tips and tricks that you can follow to build your credit relatively quickly. And so you shouldn't let step two be a barrier to entry, uh, but just a little hurdle that you need to get over in order to get the best lending rates. And so now that you have your down payment, um, your credit is in order and you have the necessary job history, we can move on to step three, which is to find some lenders and get pre-qualified with all of them. Now, when it comes to finding a professional in really any field, um, I love referrals. And now in my area, in Columbus, Ohio, there are tons of Facebook groups um, in the real estate industry. And so that's where I get all my referrals. And so I'd highly recommend um, wherever you are, research Google uh, Facebook groups, uh, real estate related Facebook groups, lending Facebook groups, and see if you can find one in your area um, and ask for referrals. Now I'd go ahead and ask for around three to five referrals when it comes to lenders. And what you're going to want to do is call these lenders up and let them know what you're looking for. So you're looking for a single family, you're looking for a four unit, owner occupied, non-owner occupied, uh, your price range, what neighborhoods you're looking in, your credit score, your income, things like that. And if the lender is any good, they're going to be able to recommend different loan products for you. Now, some banks will have specialty programs that might be much better than other banks in other areas. And so that's why we want to be referred to really the best lenders um, in your city, because they can help you find the best products and therefore get you one pre-approved, but also pre-approved at a great rate for the best down payment option. Um, and get you through to the closing process quickly. And so as you're working with these lenders, go ahead and get pre-approvals from all of them. And so they'll require certain documents from you, such as your uh, last two years of tax returns, bank statements, W-2s, pay stubs, um, a lot of financial information. But go ahead and get pre-approved with all of these lenders. So that way, when we do find a good property to buy, you can find which lender has the best rate at the time, the best fees, and then you can go ahead and lock your rate with that lender and move forward with that one on the property. And now one thing to keep in mind and one thing to, uh, to chat with the lenders about is that two to four unit properties um, can qualify a certain amount of the income that that property generates towards qualifying. And so if you don't qualify on an income level for say a duplex, 
Well, make sure that you're factoring in the monthly rental income or your lender is factoring in the monthly rental income as they can usually qualify about 50 to 75% of that income um, towards, towards the property, towards your income and help you get approved on that level. Okay, and so now we're pre-approved with a few different lenders. Um, we have our down payment saved. We kind of know what budget we're looking at. So now it's time to really define your investment criteria um, and start looking at deals. And so step four is to define your investment criteria. And so when it comes to defining your investment criteria, there's really four things we want to look at. One would be the property type. So if you want to only invest in single families or two to four unit properties, or if you want to go outside the scope of this video, but invest in commercial multifamily, such as five plus units um, or commercial property, such as retail office, things like that, that's what we need to decide in this step. Um, now, for this video, we're going to talk about residential multifamily, one to four units. And so in this step, you're going to choose, do you want to buy a single family, two to four units, or do you not care? And so if you're thinking of house hacking, for example, and living in one of the units, um, you obviously would want to consider two to four units. Um, or if you're okay house hacking and just renting out separate bedrooms, you might still consider a single family. The second criteria will be location. And so that can range from, do we want to invest in an A-class neighborhood down to a D-class neighborhood? A-class neighborhoods are obviously the best of the best, um, all the way down to D, which is, you know, hearing gunshots on a nightly basis. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> lower income neighborhoods, uh, worn out houses, dilapidated houses, um, boarded up windows, things like that. And so what I like to focus on here is A to C class neighborhoods. And I usually even steer uh, a little bit higher on that scale. So A, B, and if you wanted to use C plus, for example, neighborhoods. However, within those neighborhoods, I use my third condition to uh, whittle down further, which is the condition of the property itself. And so when it comes to the condition of the property itself, I once again rate from an A to D scale. And so A would be, you know, newly renovated, all the amenities, um, while down to D is, you know, utilities are off, vacant property, boarded up windows, full renovation. And so within this range, my investment criteria is B and C condition. I prefer value add deals that I can renovate and bring them up to say a B plus um, condition. It's very, very difficult to bring um, a B-class property up to say an A-class condition because it's going to cost a ton of money. Whereas bringing a C-class property up to a B-class is much um, simpler and much, le and much more affordable than, as I previously stated, B to A. And so finally, once you've worked through those three conditions, the final condition is what type of return are you looking for? What type of return are you expecting? And now that's also going to be affected by your previous three decisions. And so if you're looking for, say, a 15% um, cash on cash return, you're going to have to buy in lower income neighborhoods in most cities, B, C class neighborhoods, and probably a property that you can renovate and add value to and increase your return on the monthly rents. However, if you're looking for a more passive investment and you're okay settling for, say, five to 6%, cash on cash returns here in Columbus, uh, you'd be okay buying a B class asset in an A class neighborhood and then paying a property management company to take care of it. And so by defining your investment criteria in this step, we're really determining one year return and, and will this be a business or will this be more of a passive investment for you? And these are all incredibly important decisions to make before we move on to the next step, which is to get some referrals um, for a real estate agent in your market. So step number five, once you're done uh, defining your investment criteria and getting pre-approved, is to find a real estate agent, preferably one with investment experience. A great real estate agent will be able to, one, look at your investment criteria and add any considerations that you may not have thought about, as well as they'll respond quickly to your texts and your calls, um, they'll submit offers efficiently, and they'll close deals efficiently, helping you in turn make a lot of money. Whereas a bad real estate agent will just be incredibly miserable. And you can usually tell these bad real estate agents by their lack of communication and lack of education or lack of suggestions when it comes to uh, looking over your investment criteria, 
um, their lack of suggestions when it comes to what neighborhoods do they like, do they own investment property themselves, how do they like to qualify deals, how do they like to win offers and close deals quickly. And so this stuff is incredibly important and something I don't like to rush. And like we talked about with the lenders, you should really be getting at least five referrals for a real estate agent. This should be referrals from people in the industry, people that own property, who have used this agent in the past and know that that agent can get deals done, get them closed quickly at a great price. And now once you've kind of whittled down your, your five real estate agents, maybe got it down to your last couple real estate agents, it's really important to just pick somebody that you think you'd enjoy working with. When it comes to finding a great real estate deal, you're going to be searching for a while. And hopefully this real estate agent will be somebody um, that sticks with you um, throughout the years and helps you buy multiple properties. And so it's super important to find somebody you kind of mesh with, somebody you work well with, somebody who um, you trust, and that'll lead to a very successful relationship and in turn make both of you money. And so what this real estate agent is going to do is they're going to set up a search on what's called the MLS, the multiple listing service, um, according to your criteria. So according to your unit size, your price range, your location, and it's going to start sending you emails on a daily basis with new listings to hit the market. And so that brings us to step six, which is to analyze every deal. And while that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot of effort, we want to literally analyze every deal for the first month or so. Um, you want to really analyze about 100 deals in your market, so that way you start to know just instinctively when you see a new property hit the market, hey, that's a great deal. No, that, one, that one's not a good deal. So that way, as you prepare to make offers on these deals, you'll have more confidence. You'll know this one's a great deal. You'll be able to make instinctive decisions and take decisive action and be confident with the offers you're submitting. And so when it comes to analyzing these deals, I'll make a video in the future specifically on this topic, and I'll highlight a few things you want to think about now. However, there are plenty of videos on YouTube on how to analyze rental property, specifically one from Bigger Pockets that I really enjoy. So just go ahead and search in YouTube, how to analyze rental property, Bigger Pockets, and that should bring you some great resources. However, there are a few things that I'm going to touch on in this video in regards to analyzing rental property. And one of those is, is there value add in the deal? And so this really only comes into play depending on your investment criteria. So if you do decide that a value add deal is for you, and I, I highly recommend that um, if you're looking to increase your net worth quickly, then I strongly recommend you look for um, cosmetic value add deals only. And the reason for this is, especially on your first deal, budgeting for that renovation is one, going to be difficult, um, and you're most definitely going to run over on budget, run over on time, etc. However, a structural remodel brings in all different variables. It increases the risk, the time it's going to take to complete the renovation, the money that's involved, and really there's not much extra return to do a structural renovation over a cosmetic. Whereas a cosmetic, you're going to have to put less money in the deal. If you're somewhat handy, you can probably do some cosmetic renovating yourself if you're trying to save money, and it lowers your risk in the deal. Now, even when doing a cosmetic renovation, it's extremely important to kind of budget a buffer in your renovation budget. So if you plan on doing say a hundred thousand dollar renovation, which is a large renovation, um, you want to budget about 20% over that in cost, so $120,000, and also estimate that the time it's going to take to complete this renovation will be about 20% longer than you budget. Now second, you want to analyze the cash flow on the deal. And like I said, if you want more information on analyzing rental property, I'll have a future video coming out as well as Googling how to analyze a rental property, bigger pockets will turn up some great resources for you. However, in most situations, um, and depending on how much money you put down on the property, I aim for about $100 to $250 per unit in cash flow, and that in my area is a good deal. However, make sure you compare your cash flow to how much money in the deal, um, as that will determine your cash on cash return. And so then compare that cash on cash return to what you determined was acceptable for you based on your investment criteria. And finally, a part of our analysis on the deal itself is also an analysis on the location. And I don't necessarily mean the neighborhood because that should have been um, determined through your investment criteria. 
However, I mean analysis of the location of the property within the neighborhood. So for example, is this property located um, next to a commercial area? Is it on a busy street? Is there a lot of traffic? Is it next to a parking lot? Does it have a yard? Things like this. And so when it comes to analyzing the location, I don't like to see a property that's on a very, very busy street or say a residential property that's next to a predominantly commercial area. So there's a lot of factories maybe next to it. Um, I don't like to see property surrounded by a sea of parking lots. I actually analyzed a deal like that just a couple weeks ago. And the reason for all this and why you want to consider it is one, it's going to affect resale value on the property, but also it's going to affect your tenant base and the type and quality of tenants you can get to rent your property. And while it seems like this might not be too important when analyzing the deal, it's extremely important when it comes to then managing your property for however long you own it. And even if you're thinking, you know, I'm gonna have a property management company manage this property, I don't really don't need to worry about it, it will affect you through the cost of turnover, whether there's going to need to be evictions, whether um, if you're not in a great area and your tenants, you know, you can't find tenants that have credit scores over 600. You know, that's gonna cost you more money when it comes to property management, because in order to get a property management company to manage that unit, they're going to have to charge a higher per percentage fee to offset the amount of time they're going to have to put into, you know, managing that property versus managing a property in an A-class neighborhood with, you know, tenants with 800 credit scores and great income. And so unfortunately, um, step six here, analyzing these deals and looking for a good deal is where you're gonna spend most of your time as a real estate investor. It's just really the fact of the matter right now that um, in a great market, there's not a lot of great deals to be had. Now with this virus going on, that might bring some opportunity to find some great deals. However, you're going to spend a lot of time analyzing deals. However, I'd say make sure you don't get locked into this phase with um, paralysis by analysis. So if you find a deal that's close, um, go ahead and have your agent submit an offer at the price that that deal would work for you. Just because it's listed say 10 to 15% higher than makes sense for you, that doesn't mean that you can't negotiate with the sellers and get these properties down to a price point that makes sense for you. And so when you find these deals that either make sense or are close to making sense, it's time for step seven, which is to just start submitting offers. And this is where it comes down to working with a great realtor, um, a competent real realtor, because they won't let you get stuck in the analysis phase. They'll know what a great deal is, and you should know as well. However, they should encourage you to kind of push through that analysis phase and then just start submitting offers. And so this is when a great real estate agent really makes their money. When you, when you found a great deal, um, it's time for that, that real estate agent will submit an offer very quickly. They'll be very prompt. They'll have tactics and strategies to get your offer accepted over other offers. It doesn't always just come down to price. There is usually a lot of other wiggle room besides price that can get your offer accepted over somebody else's. Now, when it comes to making these offers, it's a great idea to settle on a final offer price before you really get into the negotiations. So as you start submitting these offers, um, even if you're submitting low offers, you will most likely get counter offers on most of them. So when you start getting counter offers and the excitement of the deal kind of takes over, it's very, very easy, um, even with a great real estate agent, to kind of start to chase the deal. And so what you want to do is you want to settle on that final offer price, the price where the deal, just anything beyond this, even if it's $100 past this price, I'm okay losing this deal. And so what that does is when a counter offer comes in, $1,000 over your final price, you know you, need to, you either need to counter lower or just kind of wipe your hands of this deal and walk away. When you've been analyzing these deals for, for months and you're, you're frustrated, you haven't gotten a deal yet, you're excited, um, it's super easy to start to chase these deals and let emotions take over. And then before you know it, you're under contract on a property that doesn't even make sense anymore, that you're two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 over budget on and the deal is no longer a great deal. However, even though it's very difficult to take a long time to, to find deals that are good, to analyze them, to put offers in, to not chase those, um, those bad deals, 
Um, you will eventually get one under contract. I can guarantee you that if you stick with it. And, and when you do get that property under contract, it's going to feel like a huge uh, wave of relief wash over you. However, um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of work to be done. And this brings us to step eight, which will be to, to complete your inspections on the property. If it's a value add deal, to, to start walking your contractors through the property and to start getting bids on the project. Now inspections are probably one of the most important parts of buying real estate. So when it comes to inspections, you can get physical inspections, you can get foundation, termite, radon, everything. Um, ask your real estate agent for recommendations based on your area. However, I always recommend at least a physical inspection. Um, if that physical inspection brings up concerns of possible foundation issues or termite, you can then buy separate um, foundation uh, inspections or termite inspections. Along with getting an inspection on the property, if I plan on doing a substantial uh, renovation on the deal, I usually like to walk my general contractor or a mentor, somebody who has experience in that space. I like to bring them in with me so I can start to get bids or I can start to get an idea um, of is my renovation budget correct? Am I going to go substantially over? Can I come in under? Um, and if you're able to walk a general contractor through, you can actually have the project lined up to start once you close. Now on the financial side of the inspection, if tenants are in place in the units, you definitely want copies of the leases of those. You want to see, do they have security deposits on file? What are their current rents? Do they match what um, the listing said they were? Now keep in mind when you get an inspection on a property, all inspection reports will come back with something. So in my area in particular, a lot of the houses are 50 to 100 plus years old. And so obviously those properties are gonna have a lot of issues. Um, even if they've been well maintained, they're old. And so what you want to do is if you have a contractor available, you want to take the major issues in that report and kind of get bids on the prices. And that way you can submit the bid to the seller and get a credit or negotiate for a credit um, for those items. I like to negotiate for a credit e either off the purchase price or a credit in that amount back at closing. I never want the seller to take care of any repairs themselves. Um, just because you don't know how well the repairs are going to be done. It's in the seller's best interest to complete those repairs as cheaply as possible. And so in most cases, they're going to want to just kind of put band-aids on these problems just to get you off their back and then move on to closing. However, no matter what comes back on the inspection, you always, always, always want to ask for a credit. Um, and the reason why is because this is kind of like a second negotiation. So if you have anything that you're going to need to spend money on, which you will with any purchase, you should always ask for that back at closing in the credit or off the purchase price. And that way, usually most sellers want the deal to close and they'll all offer you at least something. And so now that you've completed your inspections, you've kind of renegotiated the price a little bit if possible, and you've got it to a point where you're comfortable to move forward with the deal, you'll, your agent will waive the inspection contingency and, and you'll move on to to closing the deal. And so now that you've gotten past the inspections, there's really not too much more for you to do. Um, your lender might reach out to you or your agent for some more paperwork. They need updated uh, financial information from you. Um, the title company might reach out to you or your agent for certain information. Um, but really there's not too much to do. It's pretty much done. And so really what you're waiting for now is for your scheduled closing date and for your lender to give you the notification that you're cleared to close, which is what it is and is what exactly it sounds like, which is that the bank is ready to close on the property. Now keep in mind when you do uh, get to closing and you go to the title company and you're required at that point to pay your down payment plus um, any fees minus any credits the seller are paying, closing costs for you will usually be about 1% of the purchase price. So that is something you need to be uh, aware of before going in to make sure that you have the 1% plus the down payment plus any reserves required from the bank. However, as long as all that is in order, um, you'll pay your money at closing, you'll sign a lot of documents, and, uh, and you, you'll close on your first uh, rental property. So congratulations, that's super exciting. Um, especially after months of work closing on that first deal. Um, and while you do want to celebrate, um, there is still a lot of work to be done. <laughs>
And so now we get to the 10th and, and final step, which is to execute the business plan that you put in place when you found the property. So if it's not a value add deal, you need to, you know, call your tenants and, and get them switching over to paying you the rent on the property or your property manager needs to switch the tenants over. Or if it is a value add deal, you need to wait until the units open up from the tenants and then you need to have your contractors all lined up. So that way, as soon as the property is vacant, you can get contractors in there renovating the property. So that way your property is vacant during repairs um, as short as possible. And so guys, that's really it. That's 10 um, self-explanatory steps, not necessarily easy. Um, they will take you time. However, I promise you, if you stick with the process, work your way through the steps and find great members to put on your team, then you are just a few months away from closing that first deal and um, set on your path towards financial freedom. And so guys, I really appreciate you uh, tuning into my channel uh, for this video. Um, if you would, if you enjoyed this content, if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel, that would really help me out, especially as a small channel like mine, trying to grow, trying to get in front of um, a bigger audience so that I can help others uh, buy real estate, achieve financial freedom and, and grow their wealth. So thanks again, guys, and have a great day.